And we are an emerging community lab, and uh, we're all about uh, the biohacking community, and we want to have our own bio lab in Montreal. And to get some more experience, we're having this project called Stand Riding, where we connect with biohackers around the world. We've already had two very, very interesting and insightful talks uh, with uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and Austria. And uh, today we're going off uh, on a bit of a tangent to talk to Stefan Kasberger. He has a project called Open Science as a Practice. And uh, seeing that uh, the whole DIY bio movement is all about opening up science to the public, uh, we thought that uh, open science is a very important aspect of that. So uh, we hope to learn a lot from Stefan today. Moving on to you. OK. OK, so let's start first uh, with a short introduction of myself. Uh, yeah, my name is Stefan. Uh, I'm also from uh, Graz, so that's the uh, place where we know each other, Jutta and me. And uh, I'm currently studying environmental system science to focus on geography there in Graz. And uh, I co-founded uh, together with Christopher Kittel Open Science ASAP, uh, which stands for Open Science as a Practice, so, which I will tell a little bit more about later on. And I'm also the community coordinator for the Austrian Open Science uh, Working Group of the Open Knowledge Foundation. So yeah, and um, I'm coming kind of a background is I'm also in this kind of do-it-yourself uh, hackers uh, community. Um, and so there, there are some similarities to the biohacker scene. So can you, hear, can you see the first slide? Oh, no, I should start sharing before. Uh, yeah, it should work now, right? Can you, can you see? Yes. OK, fine. Uh, so yeah, hello, and uh, hopefully also some people on the web and uh, later on are watching it. And the first. Let's start first briefly with a short overview. So it's just the first time we are doing this live stream stuff. So it's very experimental. Uh, and on the other side, I'm also not a biology a biologist, not, not doing science in this field. So I'm a non-expert, and I ask some people about what's going on there. Uh, and maybe biology is even the weakest part of my uh, scientific knowledge, because I'm coming from a farm. And I never was interested in cows and, and how cells uh, uh, work because I saw it all day long uh, uh, at home. So yeah, I will I will begin a little bit with an an, an introduction into open science, sort of basic uh, concept about it. It's very broad. It's not very in detail. It's uh, just a short overview. Then. Uh, We'll give a short collection about different uh, links and projects uh, which are helpful for biohackers. Then a short introduction on Open Science ASAP and what we are doing right now and planning for 2015. OK, yeah. Uh, maybe it, uh, for please uh, <laughs> unmute the microphones. And yeah, and then it's an uh, extensive Q&A uh, with the people online. And you can ask questions also on Twitter. ASAP on air is the hashtag. You can reply to us. So you can make comments. Uh, and we also have an, uh, an etherpad where you can uh, collect uh, sources and knowledge about it. So let's go straight into it, uh, the, the more funny part. Uh, so what, 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 what is this kind of open science? And there is no real definition of open science. There are a lot of different groups, people, and organizations working in this field. There are also different terms used from open research to open science and open humanities and so on. And I and we as Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, we see it very broad. And, but the core issue is always the same for us. And it's described as the movement which 
tries to make scientific knowledge openly accessible and usable to all. So it's uh, very important to, to underline to all and also to make it usable because that's the biggest difference to, to traditional science as it's done right now. So what is this open all about? Because uh, the open is the critical part uh, when you want to understand uh, the difference and the change uh, we are looking forward to. And it's for us at the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, we defined the uh, open definition. And in this definition, is is included that knowledge, scientific knowledge in this case, is open if everyone can use it, reuse it, and redistribute it. Uh, so those three principles are the core of it. And there is just one requirement that you attribute uh, where the, uh, the, the content, where the knowledge is coming from. And uh, it's uh, uh, meant for everyone. So this open definition is no copyright license, but there are copyright licenses who are, com are compatible with this open definition, like the MIT or the GPL or Creative Commons Zero. Uh, but don't want to get too much into copyright. It's a, a very uh, dry area. It's just, just important to know that it's usable and uh, shareable uh, to everyone. OK, so the next question then for us is, uh, what does this then uh, mean for science in general? To what, what does uh, open mean, openness then mean if you apply it to uh, your everyday practices in research and in education? And the principles uh, standing here are defined by Peter Krakow. And some are also added by me and added also some ideas. So it's not like. The definition, as said before, there are there is no central definition. That's 2015 kind of uh, thing. Most of the people just want to do stuff. It's not so much about defining it properly or in perfection. Uh, and I will give now a short uh, overview on all these uh, uh, principles and what they mean in general. So let's start with the first one, which is open access. Uh, it's the most uh, the most known part, uh, and it's also a very mature part. And it means basically that the final publication uh, is openly accessible to everyone. Because uh, normally in research, you create some some, 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 some data, or you do something, and at the end, you write a paper or a monography. Uh, and the difference is then that it's open accessible for everyone on the web, uh, and everyone can take the publication and work with it. And yeah, you see some, some very uh, important uh, parts for biologists on the right side. Then the next part is open data. Uh, there are two uh, important parts on the first. Uh, it's to use open file formats, uh, like JSON or CSV tables, uh, so that you can uh, share easily uh, with others, because the open file formats are specified, uh, so everyone can understand how the structure is and how to create a JSON or CSV file by themselves. And on the other side, there are repositories who already share uh, this data. and. Here on the left, you see Figshare. It's a portal where you can upload your own created data. So if you collected some images or some, some tables or whatever, uh, you can uh, use Figshare to share it with everyone in the world uh, for free. It's unlimited, and it's a really nice service. And on the right, you see some examples of uh, very famous and already existing uh, open data repositories. Data.gov is maybe the biggest. I think it's the biggest government governmental data repository uh, right now. Uh, you, everyone knows NASA, there's the World Bank, and also OpenStreetMap is a very important uh, and famous project. Uh, yeah, so that, 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 that so it's one part to uh, use open file formats, and the second part is that you share your own data 
uh, openly with everyone. So the raw data and also if you have some processed file data uh, to, to share both step for both ends of your data research process with the uh, community. And the big idea is that open data together with open source uh, then makes things reproducible. Uh, reproducible is interesting and important um, more in quantitative sciences. Uh, it's not so interesting for people who work qualitatively, but when you work with data, when you write code, uh, reproducibility is really uh, an interesting part. And open source, uh, together with open data, uh, hopefully delivers an important part in uh, succeeding towards this goal. And open source also has two uh, things. On the one side, that you use open source software for your research process, because uh, when you use open source software, it's easy to change something. You can look on algorithms if they are implemented or well. And one of the most important things, uh, often the algorithms you work out are not implemented in the software, so you can implement it very, very easy uh, by yourself if you're known to coding, of course. Uh, and on the other side, it's also when you code something, like you write a short script, and an algorithm, or whatever, how to process data, making some statistical analysis, uh, uh, that you also share your own created code on the web uh, with others. So GitHub, or together with Git, and using, op using open source license, uh, is a very well-known uh, form of how to do this. How to do this. Yeah, and then the open methodology part uh, comes in. And for me personally, this is the most exciting, and uh, it's also the most radical uh, change in how science is done, because uh, it means that all, you also share knowledge about your methods more than you do right now, and that you also share your experiments. Uh, methods is meant very broad, like. Uh, you could, for example, share your scientific protocols for your, from your lab. You could record uh, your experiment with a video camera and uh, post it on YouTube. Or you can, for example, blog about your daily experiences like an open notebook. And open methodology is also very often called open notebook science. So there are different terms used for this. Uh, and this means really a, a, a big difference, and it's big, big and important point there is uh, it should not be uh, too much. It's sharing knowledge when it's relevant and when it's uh, useful for others. It's not that you uh, document every step you do. It's more like keeping the big picture in, in mind and making it together with the data and the source easier for people to reproduce your stuff. Then the peer review process, uh, I don't know, it, uh, a lot of people don't uh, know when you're studying about the peer review process, but when you wrote everything down and you have your publication, you normally go to a journal and uh, ask them if they want to publish it. And the journal normally makes the peer review process, and it's kind of the process that's assuring the quality of the results. and it's. Uh, heavily discussed, discussed right now. Uh, there are many problems appearing. Uh, and this is another way how to organize the peer review and to open up the peer review. To make it easier to comment on some publication, to make it more open and transparent, the process, uh, so that uh, the communication works better between the reviewer and the person who wrote the publication. Uh, so there's also a, a lot going on right now in this area. And the last point is open educational resources, and this means to open up the uh, educational materials. So the idea is like when you work out something for your class or for your training, to make it easy for others to adapt it to your local school or to your university or to to uh, yeah to your workshop, uh, and so it's this idea to build upon each other also on the on the teaching uh, side and on education material stuff, 
And it's a very uh, big area, and uh, often it, this is not seen as part of open science, but we decided to take it in and to have a more holistic approach, also to have every discipline in. It's not like just natural science. We mostly talk about open science uh, on a very interdisciplinary and very holistic uh, approach. So that, that's it uh, altogether. Uh, that's what we uh, see as open science. And this should deliver the, 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 the core idea of opening up science, which is always to improve science uh, itself. It's, it's making better science. It's not open is not an, 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 a goal for itself. It's, it should help to make science better, faster, and um, more, more reproducible. And yeah, so maybe you ask yourself right now why all this. I mean, this sounds sounds some some terms sounds really interesting, but maybe a little bit more concrete in in showing the advantages and the, the needs for opening up. And I want to start with the bottom picture, uh, w which stands for accessibility. And accessibility is uh, for two kind of groups very important. On the one side, we have the the public. Uh, so everyone can read open access papers. Uh, everyone can make, uh, uh, yeah, get into research a little bit through this. Uh, and also on the other side, it's easy uh, for scientists to find other research. So when you publish open access, for example, or when you write about your research on the web, uh, it's chances are higher that you get cited by someone else, because some other researchers find your work easier uh, and they use it for uh, their work then. So it improves your chances uh, uh, to get in, to build up a career in research. On the right, there is a very famous economist, uh, and it's standing for reproducibility, because Reinhard Drogov um, made an published a paper about economic power. Uh, it was an economic model. They uh, modeled that above 90% of GDP debt, uh, the, the, the state get, gets in some serious troubles. And they made some mistakes in the Excel spreadsheet they used. The algorithm was uh, wrong. And also, the data selection was wrong. And a student from the Michigan State then asked, for the data, and he saw, he looked at it, and found out pretty soon that this is uh, the model is not done properly. So the, the, the algorithms and the implementation uh, wasn't uh, correct. And if this data, for example, would have been open data from the beginning, uh, a lot of discussion about poli political, uh, uh, yeah, about the political follow-ups, uh, which this paper uh, produced, uh, would, would have been maybe a little bit different. Because this, for example, was a very important paper to uh, politicians, uh, from, more from the neoconservative side, which they used for arguing that austerity programs are ne necessary and uh, will help. And that's kind of uh, what uh, a scientific uh, underlying of the things that are going on right now in South Europe, for example. So yeah, understanding uh, what's going on and also the part of that people sometimes, uh, they're, they're also in science, uh, happens some fraud is kind of this idea that you make the process more transparent. Yeah, and another very important point is collaboration, because right now in many fields, uh, research is done uh, by large groups of tens of hundreds of researchers and also institutes. And if you openly share your knowledge and if you have open standards for your processes, for your data, uh, and so on, it makes it way easier uh, to, to, to share and exchange knowledge because you don't have to ask all the time about is it allowed to use your data? Uh, you don't have to sign all, all, all the time agreements and contracts on under which circumstances you can use your code or your data or your results. Uh, it makes things way easier in collaboration. 
And the last point is because uh, it's possible, because we can. Uh, a lot of the uh, problems uh, we see right now come from a time where there was no World Wide Web, uh, where the, the publishers had a very central role in how knowledge is organized and disseminated throughout the world. But now we have the web, and the web offers a lot of new opportunities on how to share knowledge, also in science. So a lot of things that are actually happening right now in science are comparable a little bit to what the music, music industry experienced through this new technology and how it disrupted some mechanisms. So yeah, then let's get a little bit into what, what's, what's, what's in there for biohackers in this idea of open science. And I want to start with uh, the community part. There are some organizations who are working in this field. The Center for Open Science, for example, they make the open science framework, uh, and they try to support other uh, projects in this field. Uh, the Sage BioNetworks is a nonprofit organization. Uh, they develop Synapse, that's an open source tool for data analysis uh, uh, in biology. There is Open Knowledge, the Open Knowledge Foundation, where I am part of. And Mozilla Science Lab is also getting very, very active right now. They offer some really interesting uh, positions, and they want to do more trainings in the fields of uh, bioinformatics. Uh, so these are just four uh, communities and groups I know. There are plenty more, and this is the next slides will be more like a collection of the most relevant information. And uh, the projects which are the most open uh, in, in, the in the sense I stated before in the open definition. So the first point then is uh, to uh, what, what's in for open uh, source uh, in uh, biology. And biology is very broad, and I want to focus mostly on, on wet lab and on bio uh, hacking and uh, genetic stuff. Uh, the first thing is uh, etherpads, which we use very often to write collaborative, collaboratively. So it's etherpads are very useful if you want to brainstorm, if you want to write at some concept with a lot of people all together at the same time in, time in the web. Uh, so it's a very good tool for the early stage of your project, for your research project, but also if you want to organize an event or, or whatsoever. So it's really nice at the beginning to get your thoughts structured and together. The second point, uh, it's a very popular and very important part of uh, open source right now, and also the whole idea of open science. It's the combination of Git and GitHub. Uh, Git is a versioning software for line-based files. Basically, it was developed by uh, Linus Torvald to uh, collaboratively develop the Linux kernel. And it's expanding more and more. And with GitHub, this very nice web platform where you can share then your code, share your documentation uh, with others. It's kind of a social network for developers, for open source developers. Uh, with this, uh, Git the uh, community uh, expanded way out of the traditional development open source coding type. So people use it right now to share data like CSV files or JSON files. They, they, they share documentation. You can write the markdown there. So it's really, really helpful to version stuff. So you, that you can, versioning means that you can make snapshots of your project. So once you commit a snapshot, uh, you can walk back all the versions uh, until the beginning. And so it's really good way how to work collaboratively on, on projects. There is R and Python as examples for programming languages. Um, they are very have very uh, powerful statistical analysis, also for, for biology uh, applications. It's very helpful to prepare data. Uh, so I, I don't think I need to say too much about those very famous packages. 
Uh, there is Emboss. Uh, uh, Alex Muller sent it to me from the BioLab Graz. It's a package for molecular biology. Uh, there is also BioBlender, which is um, a software which uses the Blender package and expands it for biology. And basically, it's a way how to visualize data coming from the protein data bank. So it's good to make uh, this uh, relations and this, this, this very tiny, small parts are uh, visible to others. And the last point is a very, uh, it's a, it's a very commonly used uh, writing tool to write scientific publications and to write text, Slavtech, uh, which is the main uh, way how to write collaboratively right now uh, scientific publications. OK, then the, uh, for, for open data, there, is, there are two steps. Uh, the first one is formats. And uh, there is the FASTA and the FASTQ uh, data format. I don't know if they are openly specified as it's mean, but you can look on uh, the structure of the file types. And it's, it's a thought for uh, DNA or RNA sequence data. Uh, but you. The, 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 the specification is uh, openly accessible uh, for everyone. So uh, it's the, the standard right now in some uh, data, ex in, in, in terms of data exchange for DNA data. And another new uh, standard is the rapid DNA prototyping standard. As said before, I'm not an expert, uh, and especially not then in this very uh, interesting field of uh, genetics. So I don't know which one is but those two are kind of uh, de facto standards in uh, sharing data. And another thing is uh, repositories. And the one part is uh, there are some repositories who offer you to share your data with the public. And here, most important is picture. It's you can upload as much as you want, but you have to share it openly. Uh, so it's limitless. It's, you can upload every kind of file, whatever, from your slide, from, from a presentation to big, big uh, CSV files or very specific data types used by biologists. Uh, so everything can be uh, uploaded. And there are also some national and disciplinary projects who offer this to, to the community. So it's always good to look at how it is uh, organized in your country and how it's organized in your field. And then I listed up some, some, some public data repositories. So these are repositories where Different organizations collected, or also crowd the crowd collected some data and shared it publicly uh, for other people. So, all these uh, slides and so on, I will uh, put on later on the web, and uh, everything is linked then, and you can uh, click through and look out for the stuff then by yourself. So, yeah, then. Let's let's move to open access. Um, and the first thing is uh, how to get research you you're looking out for uh, most efficiently. And uh, the, the first address all the time is then uh, look at the directory of open access chance uh, for the for all open access chance in your interesting field. Like when you are interested in bioinformatics, click on the bioinformatics subsection. And that's the easiest way to find open access journals on the web. Uh, and then I, there, are, there are the four most uh, common publishers, open access publishers. And most important is PLOS with the very big mega journal plus one and some specific uh, journals for biologists. eLife is a very well-known uh, open access journal with a very high impact factor, so very relevant uh, 
publications in there. It's uh, the editor is Randy Shackman, the, the the Nobel Prize winner, and it's very popular. And there are BioMed Central and PubMed Central, which are huge open access uh, repositories where you find a lot, a lot of publications in the field of from biomedical science, life science, uh, and all this is kind of uh, this big field of life science, biomed science, and biology. And there is also BioArchive, which is kind of a sister or sibling of Archive, the very famous uh, preprint server. And this is this means that there you can upload your publication before the peer review, so before the quality assurance is done, uh, and share it with your community and get some first feedback about your results, so that you speed up your process more and don't have to wait until the publication then is uh, published by your journal one or two years later. So it speeds up the dissemination process very uh, fast. And the other part of open access is to, to write uh, the open way. And I al already said uh, there are the etherpads for collaborative writing on the web. And there are a lot of tools where, with which you can write collaboratively on the web LaTeX documents. And I use right now Overleaf. I tried out some other uh, systems, also like Share LaTeX. Uh, but Overleaf seems, for what I need, pretty pretty good. And you see on the left, you have this folder structure and all the files in. You also have some. You can have your notes in there. In the middle, you can edit the file. Uh, so that's actually where the LaTeX is in right now. And on the right, you see the compiled document. So that's what it as and you can invite other people uh, that to to write your nice and uh, to to collaboratively write on the web. And methodology is a little bit tricky for me because I'm not so much in the method set action of biology and the process. Of the platform I can Uh, do the research project. It's from planning to executing them, so like calls and uh, execute the experiments. You can report them uh, created by the, or started by the open center I named before in the community section. And the last thing is uh, scientific protocols. I have stepped over this a few weeks ago, it's a um, tool or a platform, I don't know how to best describe, but it's it's, it's working together with GitHub, uh, two calls for uh, uh, experiments or unique protocols for it's very nicely implemented in GitHub. So it's easy to document your user and to share your protocols with the community and improve the, and improve them. Okay, and short um, introduction into the Open Science ASAP and what we are doing and what we are planning to do. And as as it's standing right there, Open Science. Uh, as a practice, the Open Science A practice, and we have our own web site. Uh, and the first thing we do is to build a community. So we work together with all kinds of stakeholders in Austria and try to bring, bring people together uh, on every level, from hackers to uh, researchers to politicians, uh, to understand and to practice uh, open science. And we have a uh, 
newsletter, which is uh, written in German, so that's, I think, for most of you, not uh, this kind of interesting then. But we, and we also have a podcast in German, but we also share a lot of stuff in English on our website. Also, this is uh, one of our uh, things we do right now. The second part is that uh, we offer WordPress blogs for others. So if anyone uh, is looking out to blog about, op about research, about science in an open way, uh, we can create you an own WordPress blog just in a few minutes. So let's say, for example, uh, the Bricku Bio Biolab wants to have an own blog. You can have bricubio.opensciencesap.org, so you get your own subdomain, and you have a fully full uh, WordPress installation with plugins, and you can share your stuff on the web with others. So it's really easy. Just get in touch with us, and we work out what you need and uh, create your own uh, blog post. The only uh, restrictions are, or requirements, better said, is uh, you have to write the band, you have to do it uh, the open way. So you have to use a Creative Commons uh, attribution license for, by default for your content. So uh, that that you want to share your experiences in, under the open definition is the important part here. And the last part is uh, something we are looking out very much in this year. Uh, we already did some training, so we went to universities, to, to communities, to groups, to hack spaces, and about as scientific practices, the open way. Uh, and this is something we want to do more this year and also next year. And for example, we, we, we taught people about collaborative writing in the sciences uh, on the web. And this is one part we are right now working together with some other people, getting in touch with some organizations and try to get some funding. Because our experience is that in, in many ways what people or universities or institutions teach young students right now on universities is not exactly Exactly, to research institute, but also the business, uh, the companies need right now. It's not state of the art, and we want to tell them the opportunities of, of applying open practices, open processes, and open standards uh, in their everyday work, and the advantage of releasing knowledge very early. Yeah. That's, that's it, basically. You have some contact uh, at the end. And I think right now it's a good time to uh, go back and start with the Q&A session. Hello, everyone there? Hello. Hey, hey. Hey, thank you so much. That was so insightful. Yeah. Could I just have a request before we start uh, off with anything? Could you just repeat the part about the open methodology because the sound uh, broke off during that slide? Ah, so you didn't hear the open methodology? No, when you talked about uh, open wetware. You said it was wet. The slide with a woman pipe cutting. So, which one do you mean? The, the biohackers? Oh, no, the. the <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> the, you're breaking up. Yes, this one, exactly. Yeah. So, the, the question is well, what's, uh, what those three points are about, or. We just when you explained it, we couldn't hear the audio because. Ah, okay, yeah, okay. That then let me uh, uh, repeat it uh, uh, fastly. Uh, open wetware uh, is an 
and wiki it's an, I noticed for quite some time uh, uh, and it's a wiki where they support this idea of open research and open education uh, and it's it's focusing on the field of biology and biological engineering um, okay. yeah so it's everyone can participate and they share experiences and knowledges about open science. The open science framework is a project from the Center of Open Science and it's a web platform where you can uh, manage the scientific process from the, the whole life cycle of it. So it's you can use it for planning, for execution of experiments and stuff you do, uh, for reporting and for this curriculum which is used also. So this offers you a an, an web platform and framework. The last point is scientific protocols and this is a very new project and this is an this project works together with Gitu the opportunity to version your protocols. So it's very nicely implemented in this GitHub uh, platform and in this idea of versioning so that you can share your lab protocols easily with uh, everyone else and version it so you can improve your uh, documentation and you make it easily accessible to everyone. Was this, was this right? Oh, that's, that's cool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, are there any questions from you? Yeah, we already have a question from Philip. Did you want to ask? Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? I see your mic is on, but... I can't hear you. Maybe do you want to post it in the chat? Oh, Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay. So actually, it was not a question. It was a comment regarding the journals, the open journals, and mostly regarding eLife. Um, first of all, for those who don't know eLife, I think it's a really, really nice journal. And what I wanted to say is that they're not just open in the sense that they're free and accessible to everyone. They're open and also in like how we can, everybody can kind of understand a section of them. So I think most people know that um, usually scientific journals are, are extremely hard to read for people that are not in the field. And what eLife does, and like PLOS also does it, uh, eLife specifically does a, what they call an eLife Digest, and it's like a summary, extremely simple summary. Like it's so simple that they usually start, for example, in biology, they start they start saying something like, "Well, cells are what constitute your bodies, and every animal are constituted of cells." You know, it's really really simplified, and it's most of the time when I just go through fast the the articles, I mean, this is, even if it's something I'm completely unfamiliar with, if I just read the eLife Digest, I have a really good idea of what the research was. So this is, I think, a really good ad for open science as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good example, too, for the, the, the innovation that can happen around open science, that people use uh, open access publications and can sum it up and communicate it to other people. And this communication is a very important part. I mean, just open access your publication and then hope that everyone understands it. It's not even working in the research field itself. And of course, not to the greater audience of the whole public. Uh, so a lot of these new initiatives like PLOS and, and PeerChase is another very interesting project and eLife they really understand the difference on how science can be done in the 21st century. So it's, it's, everyone is everyone said to me, do eLife in the presentation, that's the nicest genre. So that was my feedback. Yeah, any other comments, questions? I have a question. Uh, when you're 
looking for uh, scripts that other people have done to that other people have built to uh, analyze their data, and you want to run them on your own computer. Sometimes you find a situation where the author didn't record which version of the software or which operating system they wrote their uh, their piece of software on. And it makes it uh, difficult to reproduce that analysis. I mean, if you if you already know how to read code, you can probably adapt it to your machine. But uh, then you're altering source material, and you're not guaranteed to be sure that the intention is the same behind the analysis. Do you have any advice or insights about how to deal with this problem? Yeah, I mean, in general, uh, this is really an, an it's a very good question. It's a really important issue that is addressed in some some areas and in some not so. I mean, especially in in research fields where the where a big community is working on just one exactly process, uh, it's, it's it makes sense to uh, establish standards uh, how to share code, how to share data, and as far as I know. Uh, uh, a lot of in, bio in bioinformatics, a lot of stuff is going on, like around uh, DNA sequencing and analysis stuff, because uh, this is a huge field. A lot of people are working together, and a lot of processes are very, very common. So it's not 1,000 methods you use. It's really often using the same methods with different data and with different questions. So there is a lot of work already done, and this kind of all this. To, to, to establish and reproducible a computational environment uh, is when you see it very, very exact, very big. Uh, and if you see it smaller, it's not so much effort. You could use seeds, for example. You could install a virtual environment on your laptop and share the whole environment with others. But you also could install a virtual machine on a server with just one version and you always run it on their server. So there are different approaches. It depends a lot on the computation itself and the process. But I know in climate research there is very good stuff and in uh, bioinformatics it's also done uh, kind of good. Yeah, thank you. So I would have a question if nobody else have one. Um, can I actually make another very important remark? Sorry to cut yeah. you off. No, it's um, fine. Uh, when you, uh, uh, Stefan, when you introduced the community of biohackers, I think you, um, um, you missed a very important point, which is, uh, which are the community labs that are emerging all over the world, and which actually put the science back where uh, the community, the biohacker, wants to see see it. Because uh, we have uh, made uh, some research about the uh, community labs around the world now. And uh, because we want to connect them with this project called Stand Writing. And uh, DIY Bio, there's a lot of websites who have tried to, to establish a network. But DIYBio.org, for example, it's, uh, hasn't been updated lately. Uh, there are a few other maps that uh, try to uh, map out the, uh, um, the labs, but uh, yeah, this is a very important uh, important part of the uh, open uh, of the biohacker community that uh, is growing very fast and yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, that was not very smart from my side. Maybe I should rename the the the, the headline into institutions. Because I was, of course, I was thinking about Violet, but I thought uh, that's not the part where I can tell you something. Uh, it's more about the traditional academic institutional uh, idea, and I also kept out citizen science, which is a very interesting field. It works so nicely together with open science when you have open data and open access. Uh, it's easier for uh, people outside of classical institutions. Uh, to, 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 to do science and to contribute to this uh, idea. And, but yeah, 
that was more like, uh, of course, it's a very important part, and they have a very uh, you know, important key role, but it was meant to to show more the, 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 the other side you don't know. Okay, so you were thinking about us. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> But that uh, actually leads me to my to my uh, next question. Uh, I didn't forget about you, Philip. Um, so, you want to implement, or open science wants to be implemented at universities and businesses in businesses as well. Did I understand that correctly, or what's no? Your audience? no. Do you want to? Uh, should I answer this, or do you have another following question out of this? Because that's, that's not. Come on. <laughs> no, that's it for now. OK. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I didn't say it uh, really uh, really well. Uh, it was a little bit uh, offered some place for misunderstanding. The idea is that the process is you need to know the technology and the way how to organize knowledge and this collaborative idea of working teams together. This is something that is useful for companies, too. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not directly that we go. We are thinking of going into companies and teaching them open science. Uh, uh, it's more about educating people on the universities to write collaboratively with Etherpads, to publish your thoughts, to share your thoughts with a blog, which is uh, which I think is a really nice way to learn how to write and to write scientifically which is a little bit different from prosa or lyric stuff. Uh, so this is, but it's needed. You, you need it in a company. You need it for all challenges uh, we're facing on economic and on, on scientific uh, uh, terms. So yeah, that's, that's what I meant. So if you do implement this uh, open science at universities, uh, everybody, I'm sure, will think about um, the competition that now um, rules the world of academia and uh, how the public publication system is based on all this competition that uh, uh, that. Uh, goes on between labs and some people even say that it's necessary to have this competition for, for research to advance. What What is your take on, on this issue? I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't think open science is the answer to all the problems, so uh, uh, you have to be uh, realistic in some sense uh, uh, that it's, when you talk about this competition and the lack of funding in research now, and the more and more growing uh, fields or uh, amount of researchers and publications. Uh, that's that's also a very huge political uh, issue, and that's not just solved by changing the copyright at the bottom. But uh, of course, this is one of the most blocking mechanisms right now, which is the I mean. The thing you've addressed basically was the impact factor and this uh, search for uh, getting citations. Uh, but this is this is changing on some levels, and I think open science offers uh, some some very interesting mechanisms to transform into an, a new way how to organize this idea of science. And there are people who work in this open science field on alternative metrics. It's it's called alt metrics to enhance this um, metric uh, with more data, like how often was your YouTube video viewed, how often was your publication archive uh, and so on, so to enhance this. Also the peer review process to open up this uh, changes the power relations and open access changes the, the, the it offers the, the, the control of the scientific knowledge to a bigger audience, not just a few big publishers, uh, like we have it right now, who are in the center of organizing these uh, publications, uh, then to like community-driven, crowd-driven stuff. And 
to of, uh, to, to to organize uh, things new and all this combined with the web, with the computational power we have right now, I think it offers us a lot uh, uh, to change. Uh, also, this incentive system, which is, I don't think it will work for the next hundred years. It it does a good job in the 20th century, uh, but the exponential growth of researchers and of publications we are heading in some some issues. Uh, we have problems with life sciences, with reproducibility, so medical studies who are not reproducible, uh, it's really critical uh, in, in many ways, and also fraud is a crucial point. Yeah. So open, openness offers you a lot, but it's not the whole thing that needs to be done and addressed. Yeah, that, that uh, uh, was a very... I'm satisfied with that answer. <laughs> um, Philip, did you want to ask uh, your question? Yeah, so actually to follow up on the Thomas question regarding coding and um, how you share codes with people. So uh, analysis is one type of coding, but you also have modeling. You have modeling, for example, in neuroscience, in biology, any sort of modeling. And this area is like super dark in the sense that there's billions of ways to model exactly the same protein or whatever like I'm in computation, neuroscience, computational neuroscience and there's billions of ways to make a, a, a network or a cell or something and one of the big problem that uh, people face in computational, in modeling especially, is that the articles uh, don't provide enough information for people to reproduce the code and the researchers are reluctant to publish the code because there's so many subjective things about modeling why you chose this parameter, why you chose this and this and this. So a lot of people don't want to publish their code because they feel like in the future just by the code they'll be proven wrong and maybe some people will just focus on a specific part of the code which is not relevant in itself but might uh, somewhat um, tarnish the reputation as coders or because the code is not optimized and you know it's not everybody that codes like in the most efficient way and people don't want to be judged on this instead of being judged on the results so is there like a way to um, try to convince researchers or is there something that we can say to people to encourage them to publish their code is there like a structure or sort of guide that we can provide to people so they can publish their code and make it accessible yeah, I mean, I, I I always go for the the two direction approach. So always like try to build something bottom up, and also uh, you have to always also to look at some top down approaches uh, to change such huge uh, systems or networks of interacting uh, players in this idea. And on the one side, I think most researchers are interested in doing good science to that the results are right so offering them a hand uh, in making it sure that the, the things that you share if it's the publication or if it's the data or the source code or, but if you guide them and educate them with the stuff and if you have discourse about this stuff I think most researchers are, are happy and uh, would take this opportunity so I, and, and, and every research community is different. I mean, people in bioinformatics are very, yeah, very progressive in this statistics, uh, mathematics, uh, all these formalized areas there, that the, the state is very, very good. Uh, there are some other fields where open science is not so positively seen, like in a lot of humanities uh, and, and uh, also economics, I think uh, it's, it's not just positively. Uh, so every every community must find uh, an own way. I think I, I, I don't think it will work just uh, by a top-down approach. Like the European Union now said, open access is mandatory for research funded by the European Union. A lot of national research uh, funding agencies apply this. I know it in the in the states is the NIH uh, and the National Institute for Science NIS. I think they have now the 
you have to publish it open access if you want to get the funding. And they also now changed to, to implement open data. So also that you have to share your data. So on the one side, you have to teach the people the things they need, and you have to talk with them about uh, why it is helpful for them and for the society as a whole. And on the other side, uh, you also have to get some incentives uh, that people share things, because if you don't get anything back for sharing, uh, why do it? It's, of course, it's a little bit more uh, time, but on the long run, I think, uh, if you standardize processes and, and file formats and software, on the long run, you even uh, can save some time and some efforts in, in, in some areas, because you, you when you comment your code properly, you understand it's easy to get back into the source code two years later. If you don't do, uh, most of it is lost. No one ever can use it and implement it in a software or in an algorithm, in a, in a package, or in a, maybe also in an app, like you want to enhance sites, building a scientific app, and you just need the algorithm, but you don't understand it because it's not documented properly. So on the, on the long run, on the big picture, I think it's also very efficient, uh, but you have to make people understand that it's maybe at the first steps are a little bit uh, um, more work to do and to learn something. Basically, it's, it's, it's doing something the other way, the new way, and that's always learning and uh, it's not like uh, just changing one label and then everything is fine. Did it answer your question? Yeah. So um, um, I was just wondering if there, um, how are we on time? Do you still want to, because it's already. Chris, uh, you are the guy for the web. Is there anything from the web? Uh, unfortunately, we have no questions from Twitter or uh, YouTube comments. Come on, web. Don't embarrass us. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll give them a, a few more minutes because I have uh, just a, a short question. Is there a repository for all the open tools that you um, uh, introduced us to, uh, or can we take your slides as the repository for the for the biohacking scene? Uh, don't think there is one central repository. That's never really the idea of this open. Uh, Openness. It's more like network structure, uh, but I've listed up some 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 uh, some software. You, you can look on GitHub for open source stuff, and the, the, the language you use mostly is maybe the best point to start at. Because if you use Python, uh, there are a few pa Python packages for this, and then that's what you need. Uh, but it's not, it's not, you, you don't find a central place where you get everything. It's very, the people who are working at exactly one topic on one question, they organize it themselves and you have to get into the community. Uh, but no chance, I mean for open access journals it's easier, the directory of open access is really this kind of central point to find open access publications. But for software I don't know anything. Sadly, maybe maybe that's a good thing. I don't. I think it would just be like uh, maybe more efficient if you know. Okay, open. Uh, Want to get involved in open science and what are the tools that I can use for people yeah. like who don't have a programming background. Uh, I will. I will publish my slides after on. I hope uh, I can do it today. If not, maybe it takes a week because. During the week, I need to do some work, uh, but in there are also the links and also some some notes for the uh, uh, software and for the data repositories uh, I took out. So maybe this is a good starting point. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I think. Uh, Any questions from you? That was it from my side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, so finally, uh, for, my, for us. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm really kind of uh, empty a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I I finally, I just want to thank you very much for inviting me for this experiment, for this call. I hope you enjoyed it too, a little bit. And yeah, also thank you to the people on the web. Uh, and yeah. Hope to hear some some nice crazy stuff from you in Montreal. Yeah, um, I uh, just wanna thank you again and uh, maybe uh, do some uh, um, advertising on our own uh, uh, in for our own interest. Um, as this is part of a, a dance writing uh, series, uh, we will unfortunately not have uh, any interviews next week, uh, next Saturday. But hopefully on uh, March 27th, we'll have uh, uh, Miao from uh, Stipney, uh, bio, uh, bio Foundry, the Bio Foundry. He's a biohacker in, in Sydney. And uh, we uh, please check back for, into, uh, for updates about that uh, on bricobio.org or on eventbrite slash bricobio. Yeah, thank you. Nice. So I think let's finish it and see you next time. See you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Ciao.